Welcome to Disciple Dojo. In this episode, we are going to look at the Catholic Study Bible from Oxford University Press. I've spent the past month or so looking through this, reading through all of the features, skimming through some of the passages and some of the books, trying to get a feel for what you're going to find in the Catholic Study Bible. And so before we take a look at it, if you appreciate this review or any of our other reviews here on Disciple Dojo, we would love for you to click that subscribe button. And if you want to stay informed on when we're going to be doing live streams, we do those periodically. The best way to know about it is when you subscribe, enable notifications. That tells YouTube, hey, let me know when new content comes out. It also helps this channel grow. So very much appreciated those of you who have already done that. All right, without further ado, let's look at the Catholic Study Bible. Catholic Study Bible is by Oxford University Press. As I said, this is the New American Bible Revised Edition. This is the third edition of this particular study Bible. And as you can see, I have the paperback version. It's 1,950 pages and there are 14 color maps in the back. It's double columned and a black letter edition. Now, if you saw the video here on the channel where we reviewed the Orthodox Study Bible, we talked about how that was a resource that really lets you know a lot about orthodoxy and what the church fathers thought, but it was also very light on actual biblical scholarship. Well, this is pretty much the complete opposite of that, actually. This is fairly light on specific Catholic distinctive doctrines, very light on quotations from church fathers, from various saints. You're not going to find much about any of the monastic traditions or things that are unique to Catholicism, but it is very heavy on biblical scholarship and interaction with the text. So in many ways, this is kind of the complete opposite of this in terms of what you're getting. Like I said, this is the New American Bible translation and the revised edition of the NAB. That is sort of a mainline, you could say more liberal Catholic translation. It was done by mostly, but not entirely, Catholic scholars. Overall, it strikes me as something of a Catholic version of the NRSV. And in the beginning, there's not a single preface to the NAB. There's a preface to the NAB of the Old Testament, and then there's a preface to the NAB of the New Testament. I've never seen that before in a Bible translation. It's pretty interesting. Now, those of you that are watching, if you are Catholic and this is not your preferred Catholic study Bible, I know there are other Catholic study Bibles out there. If you want me to review one because you absolutely hate this one, feel free to send it to me. I'm happy to take a look. I'm not Catholic. I'm a Protestant. So this is like with the Orthodox Study Bible Review or the Jewish Study Bible Review. This is an outsider perspective of this study Bible. So let's take a look and see what we're going to find. Like I said, this is the paperback edition. It comes in hardback. Now, typically I like paperback study Bibles for Bibles that are going to sit on the shelf. If you haven't seen the video here where I talk about the easy way to make a cheap paperback Bible last a long time through the magic of contact paper and uh, an X-Acto knife, I'll link that in the video description. You can see. So I normally prefer a paperback like for instance, the Jewish study Bible that I have, I got it in paperback. I cover it with contact paper. And this thing, I mean, I got this, I don't know, like 15 years ago or so, and it's lasted a long time. However, I do want to be fair, this paperback, the glue on it was pretty weak and it was coming off both in the front and especially in the back where a couple of the pages just fell right out. So if you do get the paperback version of this, just beware, it's not super well bound together, but nothing a little bit of glue tape and contact paper couldn't fix and save you, I don't know, 30 to 50 bucks. So here's what you're gonna find in the Catholic Study Bible. At the beginning, there is a list of all of the editors and the contributors. Some that stuck out to me, whose work I am familiar with, John J. Collins, He's done a lot of work on the apocalyptic parts of the Bible in particular. And Luke Timothy Johnson, a very famous and well-regarded New Testament scholar. The rest, I'm just not as familiar with their work, I'm going to be honest. So you open it up and you come to the table of contents. Now, in the table of contents, it tells you who the contributors were for each section of the reader's guide and the study notes. And like I said, this is a Catholic Bible, so some of the apocryphal books are included specifically in the section Biblical Novellas. You have the book of Tobit, Judith, 
Esther has a couple of chapters that, based on the Greek version of Esther, then the books of first and second Maccabees. The Catholic Apocrypha does not include third Maccabees like the Orthodox Apocrypha does. It also doesn't include Psalm 151. There's a slight difference in the number of Ezra's that are included. So small differences between the different branches of Christianity when it comes to the apocryphal books, but they're not set apart as a separate section in the Catholic study Bible, like they are in some other study Bibles that include the Apocrypha. They're right in there with the rest of them. So then you come to the wisdom books and you have Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs. Then you have uh, wisdom, sometimes called the wisdom of Solomon, and then the wisdom of Ben Sirah or Sirach or Ecclesiasticus. It has different names. Then you come to the prophetic books and you have Jeremiah. They include, after the book of Lamentations, they include Baruch. And then when it comes to Daniel, they include some of the appendices to Daniel's, Bell and the Dragon and Susanna. Then the New Testament books are the same as all other branches of Christianity. So after that, there is a list of the different sidebar essays or charts or illustration drawings. There are not that many. There's like less than 20 throughout this entire Bible. So this is not a heavily illustrated study Bible, but there are a few. Then you have about two pages that list the maps. And then we come to the reading guide. Now, the reading guide is this much of this study Bible. It's almost 600 pages worth of material right at the front. This is before you started. The biblical text starts about 600 pages in. And throughout the biblical text, you'll see these gray boxes by each chapter, and they tell you where in the reading guide to go for more on this chapter. So you'll see, it says CRG 268 to 269. That's see the reading guide, page 268 to 269, not the Bible, page 268 to 269. So the reading guide is everything in this section, and these are all labeled RG. So you can see at the bottom, RG 302, RG 303, so the reading guide is almost like a miniature one volume commentary stuck at the beginning of the Bible. So here's what you find in it. First, there's a general introduction. And this tells who the editors intended this study Bible to be used by and for what purpose. The primary audience of this study Bible is Roman Catholic. Some of the comments in the notes to the text, the reference articles, and the reading guides deliberately reflect Catholic experience and Catholic interest. However, the editors do not wish to exclude other Christian readers from the focus of this book. In most instances, the materials included here will be useful for all Christians who want to enter deeply into the mysteries and marvels of the Bible. So they're letting you know this is intended to be used by Catholics, but also to be used by other Christians in other settings. So it continues on with an overview of the Bible, how the Bible came about, the canon of Scripture. They make note of the Council of Trent was where the Catholic Church finally and ultimately sealed the canon of what books were considered to be part of Scripture. They have a note about the difference between Catholic and Orthodox canon and which books the Orthodox Church recognizes that Catholics don't. And then there's a section that talks about the different literary forms in the Bible, the different genres of writing, and how you can't read the Bible in a flat manner where you just read everything the same and take it all literally or all symbolically that there's a need for different approaches to different books of the Bible. Then it goes on to talk about the text itself and different translations. And then specifically, it talks about the New American Bible translation and how that came about. Then it goes on to talk about reading, studying, and praying the scriptures, and how within Catholicism, especially over the past 50 years or so, there's been sort of a revolution in terms of how important the Bible is. And they talk about how at certain points within Catholic history, scripture has been downplayed in favor of more systematic theological approaches or philosophy. But things changed primarily due to Vatican II. They say the Second Vatican Council gave a strong impetus to a biblical renewal in every dimension of Catholicism, as has subsequent papal documents such as Pope Benedict XVI's exhortation, Verbum Domine, the word of the Lord, and that of Pope Francis, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. And you see that reflected in this study Bible. This, like I said, unlike, say, the Orthodox study Bible, there's very little Catholic theology or Catholic doctrine or Catholic dogma presented in this study Bible. And there's a lot of biblical scholarship 
albeit from a more mainline critical hermeneutic of suspicion documentary approach. And so it starts with an essay on the biblical text and their background. And it goes through the major periods of biblical history, the time of the patriarchs, the exodus and the wandering, period of the judges, the monarchy, exile and return, the Greek conquest, the Hasmonean period, the Roman period. After that, there's an essay on how to use this study Bible. It talks about the different resources, so the translation itself, first of all, how to use the different footnotes that are found in the NABRE, and then the reading guides, what the purpose of the reading guides, how to use those. And it says, these are guides for each book of the Bible, and their purpose is precisely to lead the reader through the structure and basic message of each biblical book. Then there's a note about some of the reference articles that are featured, and then the different things you'll find at the end, the glossary, the concordance, weights and measures, the lectionary is included, and then the indexes. And they say, what I suspected when I picked this up, that this is intended to be used to particularly in classroom settings by teachers. It says the Catholic Study Bible is particularly useful for the college or religious education classroom. It provides teacher and student with virtually a one-volume textbook and reference library on the Bible. And this very much has the feel of other academic study Bibles, like the New Oxford Annotated, or the New Interpreter's Bible, or the HarperCollins Study Bible, or the SBL Study Bible. Then we come to an essay on the Bible and Catholic life, and this was really helpful in terms of talking about the history of how Catholics have used or sometimes not used the Bible. So it unpacks that whole concept of what happened around Vatican II in the 1950s and why now Catholics are much more prominent in the field of biblical studies than they were a century ago. Then it talks about how the Bible has been studied throughout history, how the New Testament authors used the Old Testament, the different methods that some of the church fathers and medieval Christian interpreters used like the literal method, the allegorical method, the anagogical method, and the moral or tropological method. It kind of unpacks what each of those mean. And it goes more into what happened in the modern period and how the Catholic Church has come to actually embrace biblical higher criticism. It gives an overview of the different types of biblical criticism, like historical criticism, literary criticism, redaction criticism, it talks about archaeology and its place in biblical studies. And then it talks about how Catholics attempt to reconcile some of the findings of higher criticism with what the church believes and teaches about the nature of scripture. So they take the documentary hypothesis as long established fact. That's important to know. You're going to get that when you read this Bible. They take things like in the New Testament, uh, Pauline authorship, they say, those epistles whose direct Pauline composition is doubtful, such as the pastoral epistles, Ephesians, Colossians, Second Thessalonians, are best understood as later attempts to bring the figure and teaching of Paul to bear on situations facing the churches in the late first century. They also take for granted that Q is a source that the gospel writers used. And then they note the paragraph in De Verbum that talks about some of this stuff, and it says, the sacred authors in writing the four gospels selected certain of the many elements which had been handed on, either orally or already in written form, others they synthesized or explained with an eye to the situation of the churches, while sustaining the form of preaching, but always in such a fashion that they have told us the honest truth about Jesus." And so they conclude, there is no obligation for Catholics to be conservative historians of early Christianity nor is there any obligation for them to be reckless or indifferent. As long as Catholic scholars make clear the link from Jesus through the early church to the evangelists, they remain faithful to their theological heritage. Then there's a section that talks about the place of tradition in the life and the doctrine of the Catholic church. And they say, the Catholic church does not restrict divine revelation to the biblical text. Against the Protestant Reformation slogan of Scripture alone, Catholic theologians insisted on Scripture and tradition. So they say Catholic Christianity is not simply a religion of the book. So obviously this is a major difference between a Catholic and a Protestant study Bible. Orthodox would say the same thing, by the way. They would just point to Orthodox tradition as the real thing rather than Catholic tradition. So then the rest of it goes on to talk about what 
the Catholic Church believes about the role of tradition and how it should never contradict scripture. They should work together because ideally they both come from God. And they note that Vatican II did not clear up all the questions that people have about the relationship between tradition and scripture. They say the precise relation between scripture and tradition also remains a problem. As a pastoral council, Vatican II avoided becoming an arbiter of theological disputes. Its insistence on the oneness of scripture and tradition however, did have a pastoral dimension. While not conceding to the scripture alone position, that's Protestantism, it insisted that the Bible take again its rightful place in the center of Catholic life and that appeals to tradition be judged according to their consistency with scripture. So I, actually, that was interesting that they recognized the tension between scripture and tradition that pretty much drove the Protestant Reformation and how even among Catholics, terms like inspiration, inerrancy, and revelation are never really hammered out with the precision that makes everyone happy. And so that there are disagreements even among Catholics on those things. And so they talk about the concept of inerrancy, for example, that says, since therefore all that the inspired writers or sacred writers affirm should be regarded as affirmed by the Holy Spirit, we must acknowledge that the books of Scripture firmly, faithfully, and without error teach that truth which God, for the sake of our salvation, wish to see confided to the sacred scriptures. And so they say, the key expression in this statement is that truth which God, for the sake of our salvation, wished to see confided to the sacred scriptures. Without explicitly embracing the theory of only limited inerrancy, that statement suggests that the Bible's inerrancy consists primarily in its being a trustworthy guide on the road to salvation. Thus, it expresses inerrancy in a positive way and avoids conceiving it as a defensive program of protecting the Bible against accusations of scientific or historical error. Now, it should be noted, it's not just Catholics that debate the concept of inerrancy. This is something that all Christians have had to wrestle with at some point. And there have been numerous books written on what inerrancy means. Is scripture inerrant? Is it infallible? Is it authoritative? The, the wording of that, it's more prominent among Protestants, obviously, because of sola scriptura, but it is acknowledged as something that Catholics do talk about, think about, and write about as well. So then it goes on, section on the authority of the Bible, scripture and church life. And then we come to an essay by Ronald Simpkins on biblical history and archaeology the Old Testament. It covers the different contributions that archaeology has made to biblical studies. It gives an overview of the archaeological periods like the Bronze Age, the Exodus in history, and it notes the work of prominent biblical archaeologists like Kathleen Kenyon, W.F. Albright. But you see that hermeneutic of suspicion that I was talking about. You really see it in this essay. Here are a couple of examples in talking about Albright's work. It says, although widely influential, Albright's interpretation is no longer credible. And when it comes to the patriarchal narratives, in the end, the ancestor narratives reflect the period of the Iron Age in which they were written and provide no evidence that they preserve historical traces of past events. Then on Exodus, it says the story is told in accordance with the widely recognized mythic pattern of the conflict myth, and many aspects of the story have a supernatural rather than a historical character. So immediately putting a divide between anything supernatural and anything that could happen in history. That's a philosophical a priori assumption that needs to be pointed out because certainly not all biblical scholars operate from that paradigm. It goes on to talk about the numbers in the book of Numbers and how the 600,000 or so men render it historically impossible. Other aspects of the story call its historicity into question. For example, the story does not record the name of the Egyptian king. And this is extremely odd since elsewhere the biblical writers mention the names of most other foreign kings. Uh, it's odd unless it was intentional, which many Exodus interpreters say that's actually the point, is this self-aggrandizing pharaoh who was intent on preserving his name has his name completely removed from history. And all everybody remembers is this group of slaves that came out of Egypt under the name that matters, which is Yahweh. That's an aside, but this is just an example of two ways you can look at the same data. He also goes on to say the depiction of the plagues is also not historically plausible. Although many of the individual plagues are natural events that can occur in Egypt, the combination of all the plagues, the scope and severity of the plagues, and the references to the plagues not affecting the Israelites or their animals challenge a historical reading of the story. They challenge a naturalistic reading of the story, not necessarily a historical reading of the story, 
if you accept the main premise of the Bible, which is that God is real and does exist and does work through history. So you can see some of these mainline, a priori, anti-supernatural assumptions, and it's not unique to this essay. You see this through a lot of the notes and the material in this study Bible. So we could spend like an hour just going through the essays in here and pointing these types of things out. But that's just I think that's enough of an example to show you where most of the notes in this, particularly in the Old Testament, are coming from. Then there's an essay on biblical history and archaeology in the New Testament. It's not quite as long, but it's still pretty substantial. It gives a lot of the background of the Roman Empire, obviously New Testament history takes place within like one century as opposed to the Old Testament history, which spans millennia. So most of this is about life in the Roman Empire. Things like the Pax Romana, the Roman roads, the concept of patron and client, which is very important in understanding the world of the New Testament, domestic life, honor and shame. So I found this a very helpful essay. It wasn't nearly as bogged down with anti-supernatural assumptions. In general, it was just more helpful than the Old Testament essay. Then we come to an essay on Catholic interpretation of the Bible. And so kind of the different periods of Catholicism. Now, it is interesting that they do go out of their way to note uh, the church fathers and call them Catholic. So people like Justin Martyr, John Chrysostom, these are church fathers. I don't think it's fair to call them Catholic because the Orthodox would call them Orthodox. So I think it's a little bit, unless you're using lowercase c Catholic, but they don't, they use uppercase c Catholic. Uh, lowercase c Catholic in the sense of like universal, that'd be fine. But presenting them as Roman Catholic interpreters, that's a little bit of massaging the truth, I would say. I'd love to see Orthodox scholars respond to this. But they do a good job talking about things like the allegorical approach of the Alexandrian readers versus the more context-based approach of the Antiochene interpreters. They talk about how important the Glossa Ordinaria was, which we've actually reviewed here on the channel, the Glossa Ordinaria to Genesis. If you're interested in that, check the show notes. I'll put a link to that in the description below. They talk about Stephen Langdon adding chapters into the Bible in the 1200s, and then Thomas Aquinas and his influence. Then they go to the early modern period. This would be the Reformation period. There's an overview of the Council of Trent and how it was sort of reacting against the Reformation. So the Reformation was like, everybody can interpret scripture for themselves. Council of Trent was like, nobody can interpret scripture for themselves. And then the final section, the coming of age of Catholic biblical scholarship, 1943 to 2000. This again deals with the events of Vatican II. And then some of the Catholic scholars who have emerged in the last century. People like Adelia Yarbrough Collins, Feme Perkins, Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza, R.E. Brown, John Collins, Joseph Fitzmaier, and the work that Catholics have done within SBL, the Society of Biblical Literature. Then we come to an essay on biblical translation and pastoral interpretation. It talks about why there's a need for new translations and how languages change and different translation theories and philosophies that translators take when they're creating multiple translations. Then this is really helpful. It gives an overview of different translations, English translations, a brief description of those translations, and then a sample text, in this case, Psalm 86, 14, so you can see how the different translations render the same verse. So you have the New American Bible, RE, that's this one, came out in 2011. They compare it to the New Revised Standard Version, 1989, which of course has been updated. The NRSV UE came out a couple of years ago. The NIV, updated as of 2011, the, the Revised English Bible, a British translation, the New Living Translation, an American Evangelical Translation, the CEV, Contemporary English Version, New King James Version, New American Standard Bible, the Tanakh, and the Net Bible. This is just a really helpful overview in general. I like seeing it. And so it concludes with this pretty interesting observation about the Catholic document, De Verbum. It says, De Verbum notes that just as Jesus Christ is both God and human, and the one cannot supplant the other, so the Word of God, the sacred scriptures, is is both divine and human. God is the true author of the Bible, but the human writers who use the language and genres of their time are also true authors. This mystery is ensured by the Holy Spirit who works in these human authors so that the essential message of salvation God desires is communicated in ways that people can understand. And this is something that pretty much every Protestant would also sign off on as well. I know I certainly would. I think that's exactly right. But then they qualify it. 
again, noting that passage from Dave Urban, they say the scriptures teach faithfully and without error what is necessary for our salvation. That is moral and doctrinal teaching, not historical or scientific. So this is where you would get pushback from some, but not all Protestants. There are some Protestants who would sign off on that and say, absolutely. Others who would say, absolutely not. And then some who are in between and say, it would depend on the genre and the passage in question. So after that, there's an essay on the Bible in the lectionary, uh, why the Catholic Church uses the lectionary, what's the purpose of a lectionary. For those that don't know, the lectionary has a three-year cycle where every day there are certain passages that are read and it just goes through and then it repeats. So if you are preparing a sermon as a Catholic, you don't have to figure out, oh, what am I going to preach from this week? You look in the lectionary, that's what you're going to preach from that week. And that's not just Catholic. You see that in Anglican churches, you see that in Orthodox churches, you even see that in Judaism with the weekly parasha, the reading from scripture. So it talks about that. It explains the purpose of it. What are the principles and putting it together how it was intended to focus on the Gospels. That's why there's not as much from other parts of the Bible as there are from the Gospels in the lectionary. The church calendar, ordinary time versus sacred time, the different seasons, Advent, Lent, Easter. Then you come to an essay on the Pentateuch. This presents a documentary hypothesis as sort of the foundation, but then it notes that there is a fragmentation among scholars today, and the classical documentary hypothesis is no longer the dominant idea that you're going to find, but instead you're going to find variations of that hypothesis. And so instead of JEDP, sometimes you'll find P and H, depending on which scholars you're looking at and which sources, which parts of the Pentateuch. But what's not given any credence to at all is the idea that the Pentateuch was compiled either mostly or all by Moses or even within the second millennium. So you're getting pretty much mainline biblical scholarship, whether secular, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, just be aware of that going into this. Or like they say, the Pentateuch was compiled after the exile. So little, if any of it, would go back to the time of Moses. And now we're well into the reading guide. So after the essay on the Pentateuch, then you have the reading guide on Genesis. And this is like a commentary on the text of Genesis from a literary perspective. And so it'll tell you, see pages 9 through 81 of the Old Testament. So if you turn to page 9 of Genesis... There's the introduction to the book of Genesis, and the little box there will say CRG 120 to 134. So it's saying, hey, see the reading guide, which is reading guide pages 120 to 134. So you flip back, reading guide page 120, that's the reading guide that walks you through the book of Genesis section by section. There's an illustration of the cosmology that Genesis presents, then it goes through the different sections, Genesis 2, 4 through 11, 26. And then specifically 2, 4 through 6, 4. And then even more specifically, 2, 4 through 3, 24. So you're getting kind of a telescoped guide through the book of Genesis. And Genesis 4, Genesis 5 through 6, then the flood, Genesis 6 through 9. Then the origin of Israel's ancestors, Genesis 11 through 50. And then Abraham, Genesis 11 through 17. Isaac, Genesis 25 and 26. Jacob, Israel, Genesis 27 through 33. So it's walking you through the book of Genesis and giving you the story as it unfolds. And then Exodus, it does the same thing, presents the book, walks you through it and gives a bibliography at the end. Now, one thing I did appreciate in the Exodus reading guide, there is a lengthy section, Exodus 20 through 24, that talks about ancient Near East suzerainty treaty covenants. That is incredibly helpful background for reading Exodus. And so I was glad to see them mention that and elaborate on it. So you have that for all of the books of the Bible, reading guide that walks you through the book and then a bibliography that if you want to study more, you can go there. Now, what that means is when you actually get out of the reading guide and get to the Bible itself, a lot of the study notes are going to be a little repetitive if you've read through the reading guide. So this essay on the Pentateuch, this is at the beginning of the Bible now. Now, there was an essay on the Pentateuch at the beginning of the reading guide. This is a more condensed two and a half page version. Then there's an introduction to the book of Genesis. That's again, another maybe two, 
two and a half pages. And much of that was already said in the reading guide in Genesis. Then you start the text. Now, this is a little confusing just graphically the way the Bible is laid out. I don't love it. All of this is introduction to the book of Genesis. And it's right. There's like there's no page separating. It's just all the materials kind of crammed together. Introduction to Genesis, introduction to Genesis, introduction, outline of Genesis, boom, Genesis starts. So this is the text of Genesis. This is the introduction. It's just not very clear other than that one heading. And then the notes are right there. There's a line separating the two columns on the page, but there's no line separating the study notes. It's just different size font. So just graphically in terms of ease of use and how to quickly find something and get your bearings, this is one of the poorer laid out study Bibles that I've seen, if I'm being honest. But you've got the text of Genesis, and then you have the study notes, and these are annotations of what is spelled out more fully in the reading guide, basically. And then in the bottom corner, these are the cross references that the NABRE uses. So that's what you have. You, this is what the pages look like. Each section, again, it points you back to the reading guide for more. And like I said, think about the reading guide, like the first 600 pages of this Bible as a walkthrough of the Bible, and then the biblical text, and then the footnotes that are condensed versions of what was in that walkthrough. There are a few maps. There are not many. There are very few illustrations. The paper is pretty thin. I mean, you can see some bleed through here. It's it's not the worst I've seen. It's not as bad as the SBL study Bible, but it's also not great. So if you're highlighting, it's going to bleed through. There's not really much room in the margins for writing or taking notes. Like I said, the apocryphal books are put in with the other books or not in a separate section like you'll find in some mainline Protestant study Bibles that include the Apocrypha. So right after Ecclesiastes and the Song of Songs, you come to Wisdom of Solomon. And then right after Wisdom of Solomon, you come to Sirach. And then you're into the prophets. We like kind of look at the theology of where different study Bibles are coming from here on the channel. Uh, and so I'll make a couple of comments about that. In terms of Genesis and Exodus, you're getting typical mainline hermeneutic of suspicion. So mosaic authorship, not even remotely an option. None of the Pentateuch dates back to the second millennium. It's all post-exilic. The Exodus never really happened. Israel kind of arose from within Canaan and the Canaanites mixed together. And then later they sort of came up with this national history of an Exodus out of Egypt. This is all standard stuff in liberal mainline scholarship. And the Catholic Study Bible, that's what it's operating from. So if you are a conservative Catholic, you are not going to agree with the study notes in this Bible for the most part. Another hot button issue that we like to look at how study Bibles handle is complementarianism and egalitarianism. Now, in Catholicism, this isn't a debate because only men can be priests. End of story. Whereas in Protestant and Anglican churches, you have debate over can women be ordained in ministry. For Catholics, it's, it's a done deal. However, even there, I was expecting to see some of the texts that have to do with the whole complement and egalitarian. I was expecting to see notes that reflected a more egalitarian reading because so many of the other notes throughout were not afraid to push back against what people would consider traditional views. So I was interested, how are they going to handle some of the complementarian clobber passages, so to speak? And the answer is very much complementarian. The study note on 1 Timothy 2, he just says, Women are not to take part in the charismatic activity of the assembly. 1 Timothy 2.12, see 1 Corinthians 14. Now, you flip to the 1 Corinthians 14 note, and interestingly, that note says, it's difficult to harmonize the injunction to silence here with 1 Corinthians 11, which appears to take it for granted that women do pray and prophesy aloud in the assembly. Hence, the verses are often considered an interpolation, reflecting the discipline of later churches. Such an interpolation would have to have antedated our manuscripts, all of which contain them, though some transpose them to the very end of the chapter. So this study note in Timothy says women aren't to participate in any charismatic activity in the church. See this verse and see 1 Corinthians. Then when you flip to 1 Corinthians, it says, well, this verse is hard to square with the fact that women do pray and prophesy earlier in the book of Corinthians. And so some have even said this verse isn't even originally in scripture. So basically this note is much more egalitarian and this note is much more complementarian because look what it goes on to say. Women are not to take part in the charismatic activity of the assembly or exercise authority. Their conduct there should reflect the role of man's helpmate 
and not the later relationship of Eve to Adam. As long as women perform their role as wives and mothers in faith and love, their salvation is assured. 1 Timothy 2.15. I don't even know any complementarians that would interpret the text that way in that straightforward of a manner. So in such a, shall we say, liberal study Bible, this was a surprisingly, shall we say, conservative approach. Another thing that surprised me, honestly, was the treatment of Romans. The reading guide and the study note to Romans were pretty heavy on justification, on what would typically be considered a Protestant or Reformed reading of Romans. Like You could have told me that the study notes of Romans were done by a Protestant in a Protestant study Bible, and after reading them, I would have thought, yeah, that sounds about right. So there was very little that I found specifically Catholic in the Romans notes. Now in Romans 7, when it comes to who is the I in Romans chapter 7, there are no study notes that really get into it in the text. But in the reading guide, there is a section that talks about the I. And they say this is important to realize this is not autobiographical. So unlike many reform, not all, but many reform reading of Romans 7, they do not take this as Paul describing his ongoing struggle with sin, but they don't really give the opposing side of the argument. Then when it comes to Romans 9 through 11, there's not really much discussion that I saw about issues like predestination and God's election of people to salvation or any of that, but those are typically more standard in Protestant treatments. There is the note that the all Israel in Romans 11, they don't take what would be considered like a, a premillennial approach to that or a future mass conversion of ethnic Jews. They see all Israel as Jew and Gentile together in Christ. And then lastly, when we come to Revelation, I, I got to say, this was the highlight of the study Bible for me. Luke Timothy Johnson did the notes to Revelation and the introduction and the reading guide. I thought it was a very, one of the better introductions to Revelation that I've seen in terms of laying out Revelation in its context, talking about the symbolism, talking about the Roman Empire, the different approaches to Revelation, how to read it, how not to read it. It does completely do away with any dispensational readings of Revelation. So if you're a dispensationalist, you're not going to be getting any of that in the study Bible. But if you're an amillennialist, say, or even some forms of historic premillennialism, you're going to read a lot of this and go, oh yeah, I track with that. That's right. There's background on the seven churches, the notes on Laodicea and Revelation 3, they mention Laodicea's industries, its ISAV, they mention the hot springs at Hierapolis and the cold springs at Colossae. So the introduction and the notes on Revelation stand out to me above everything else in this study Bible. There is not a discussion of the different millennial views. Uh, Catholics hold to an amillennial approach, so you're not going to get premillennial, postmillennial, you're not going to get different end times scenarios, things like that. That's an area where Catholics and many Protestants actually do agree. So then after Revelation, you've got a glossary, and this just gives you some of the names, some of the places, some of the people, just definitions. Then obviously weights and measures. Then you have the lectionary, readings for the different feasts, weekday readings, and then you come to the index to the reading guide. So this is all of the subjects and the concepts and the topics that are going to be addressed in the reading guide in the beginning. Then after that index to the reading guide, you have the collaborators, the people who put together the original New American Bible back in 1970. And then you have the people who were responsible for the different updates. Then you come to the concordance, and this is the concordance to the New American Bible. So this is where you would look up the different words and find which scripture passages they're in. After that are the maps, and these are really good quality maps. And then the very last thing is the index to the maps, how to find a specific place on a specific map. And that's it. So that's what you're going to find in the Catholic Study Bible by Oxford. This has been a long review. I wanted to do justice to what was in here. I'll just briefly share my thoughts. One, I'm not a Catholic. I cannot judge how faithful to Catholicism this is. If you are a Catholic and you've used this, feel free to let me know what you think about it. I'm an outsider looking in. So honestly, though, this strikes me as a Catholic version of the JPS study Bible by Oxford as well. This comes from a largely liberal mainline Jewish perspective. This comes from largely liberal mainline Catholic perspective. And it's actually incredibly close to the other Oxford publication, the new Oxford Annotated Study Bible. 
which includes the Apocrypha. Other than a few of the essays that had to do with like the lectionary or Vatican II and De Verbum, really this is incredibly similar to what you find in Oxford. I've reviewed the Oxford here on the channel. You can check that out. My thoughts on this are pretty similar to my thoughts on this, honestly. So I think these are all three kind of drinking from the same wells in many ways, but with different theological emphases. But I mean, it's basically like, this is the Catholic version. This is the Jewish version. This is the ecumenical version. All of these are intending to be academic focused, biblical scholarship focused, all operate from a hermeneutic of suspicion. That doesn't mean that everything in them is bad or wrong. I found a lot of good material in each of these. I'll keep and refer to each of these from time to time because they do reflect different traditions from the one I come from. And I think that's a good thing. But like I said at the beginning, these are kind of opposites on the scale. So this one, very light on biblical scholarship, very heavy on church tradition. This one, very light on church tradition, very heavy on biblical scholarship. So I would not recommend this as a primary study Bible. Even if you're Catholic, I wouldn't recommend this as a primary study Bible. I'd recommend it as if you want to know what mainline Catholicism teaches and how it aligns with broader mainline biblical scholarship, I think this would be helpful. I don't think you'll get much devotional or pastoral use out of this, honestly. I mean, it's nice to have the NAB translation that I can refer to and compare to other translations, but you can get that on version or pretty much any Bible app. So yeah, I unless you really want to know what liberal mainline Catholics think about the Bible, I don't think I would recommend this. I, I definitely would recommend this as a primary study Bible. If you are a professional Bible studier, like you do it for a living, you preach and teach, this might be worth having on your shelf to consult. But yeah, even as an outsider, as a Protestant, you know, I was wanting to learn more about the specifics of Catholicism and how Catholics handle certain passages of scripture. And so much of what I read in this was just what I read in typical liberal mainline Protestant interpretation. So I just didn't get a lot of um, specifically Catholic teaching in this. Those are my thoughts. They're entirely subjective. Again, I am not a Catholic, so take it for what it's worth. This is just how this Bible strikes this Bible nerd from a general evangelical Wesleyan background. Those are my thoughts. What are yours? I'd love to hear them. Leave them in the comments below. That's all for now. If you appreciate this review and the work that goes into it, great way for you to show that is just by clicking that subscribe button and enabling notifications. That is huge. Stay tuned here at Disciple Dojo. We're going to be doing more giveaways. We're going to be doing more live streams, more Bible reviews, interviews with phenomenal scholars, one coming up this week that I'm excited to get out there to you guys. So keep following along, keep supporting the channel, and as always, keep training.